Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Content Marketing Best Practices for Construction, sponsored by the Construction Marketing Association, as well as our sponsors, which we'll talk about. My name is uh, Neil Brown. I'm the chairman of the Construction Marketing Association, and that, there's my email there. And with me today is our esteemed uh, colleague and board of director uh, and editorial director of Modern Trade Communications, Paul Deffenbaugh. So let's get right to uh, the agenda. Uh, but before we do a, a little housekeeping, um, I want you to know that um, this presentation deck will be available to all registrants uh, in a follow-up email uh, in the next 24 or 48 hours. So uh, don't worry about uh, taking copious notes. And uh, also there's a lot of resources uh, at the end that uh, have links that you can, uh, with the, this presentation, you'll be able to just hyperlink on. So that's good to know. Um, the second uh, item is that uh, we do have a question and answer and I invite you to uh, ask questions early and often using the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll, we will answer questions in the order they're received, so, so do, uh, do ask early. And uh, lastly, I um, want to let you know that we have a hashtag for today's webcast, uh, Construction Content 19, so we will be posting content uh, throughout the, the webcast and invite you to uh, use that hashtag as well in your social media. So again, welcome and uh, going to talk a, a couple minutes about our sponsors, uh, Nespro Personal Protective Equipment and Acumatica, which is a uh, construction software, an ERP construction software. And um, then I will be covering our national survey content marketing survey results a uh, brief survey that we started a few months ago so and I'm also going to reference uh, a survey that I re read every year uh, a study uh, from the content marketing Institute so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and again we have uh, some references to that in resources and then finally we will introduce our esteemed Panelist Paul Deffenbaugh will share his uh, perspective on content marketing, and he is a journalist, so he has uh, a very unique perspective. And as mentioned, uh, questions and and answers, and uh, and then a bunch of resources uh, at the end. So, so with that, uh, going to get right into it, and. Uh, so let's talk about our, our sponsors, and that's Pro um, PPE is uh, a manufacturer and distributor of electrical safety personal protective equipment. And uh, they are a national sponsor for CMA. And then, as mentioned uh, briefly, Acumatica Construction Edition is a software, an ERP software, that has a field service edition, job costing, and a lot of other features. So it's uh, it's completely cloud and uh, very fast growing software. So those are our sponsors that make this all possible. And uh, so let's get into our survey. And I'm very happy to share with you that 100% of our respondents, and we had uh, nearly 100, respondents are implementing content marketing uh, this year so so that is uh, reinforces that in my opinion content marketing is the hottest topic in all of marketing so let's get right into the types of content marketing that are being used and everyone is using website content and social media now these are presented in order of the uh, of the survey. Um, so if we jump down, the next uh, largest content type is brochures, 
and collateral and catalogs and things of that nature, followed by newsletters and video and case studies, blogging, etc. So, so another way to look at this uh, would be to array them, uh, which uh, perhaps we can do uh, later. So those are different content types. Um, down to uh, syndicated content, infographics, and other. And I do, uh, I did look up that other, and uh, it uh, had to do with uh, uh, sales calls. So that's, uh, and then I think there was another one about surveys in that other category. So, so uh, when you're doing content marketing, what is your primary objective? The largest, uh, biggest uh, lead. Uh, objective was lead generation at 35%, followed by awareness and reputation, uh, and, long, and then followed by search authority and website traffic. So, so all excellent objectives, but uh, but lead generation uh, is paramount. And then uh, an open-ended uh, question: What is your most effective content marketing tactic? And uh, I was kind of surprised that social media was uh, ranked uh, tops at 21%. Not surprised about blogging at 17%, and email or newsletters um, at 13%, then video, web content, case studies, white papers, editorial, media placements, something Paul will talk about. Uh, AdWords, uh, I was surprised that that was listed in content marketing. Uh, and then social advertising and surveys. So, so anyways, uh, some types of content uh, uh, rated by effectiveness. How is content marketing measured, or how are results measured? Pardon, pardon the siren there. Our offices are right next to a busy highway. Um, so the most, uh, the biggest measure is analytics. And uh, that makes sense because everyone is using Google Analytics for their website, so so that indirectly might reinforce that people are measuring their website traffic. And that's uh, followed by social engagement. So social media really coming through here today in, in the subject of content marketing. And then uh, back to that important objective, lead uh, Generation so lead generations at uh, registrations at 29% and RFQ RFP uh, requests at 14%. So, so some different measures for content marketing, uh, all uh, excellent, including e-commerce sales. So uh, I know we have an e-commerce uh, um, vendor uh, complete the survey at least one. So uh, another uh, way to look at this is uh, where is content. Uh, uh, developed, uh, where is it implemented? And uh, a vast majority do content internally, and and this is probably uh, intuitive because um, content can be technical, and the subject matter expertise can reside internally. Um, external uh, by itself was was very small, only four percent. But a really good portion of respondents using some combination of internal and external, and I will reinforce that uh, you know as the CMA does marketing services, most of our clients do some uh, portion of content, while CMA providing marketing services provides uh, content, and often the majority of content, but that would be this combination. So makes uh, total sense to me. So with that, uh, the last piece of it was some classification questions. How do you classify your company? What type? And we had a good uh, representation of building products, manufacturers, um, a uh, small number of equipment uh, and tools, manufacturers, uh, a lot of different types of uh, construction services, commercial construction, home builders, remodelers, and then uh, a fair amount of consulting, marketing, and media services. Maybe uh, 
maybe Paul Deffenbaugh uh, completed the survey as a as a publisher and gone in there. So, and then um, what size of, of is your company by employees? So here again, a really good mix. Uh, uh, biggest group uh, between 26 and 100, and uh, but a, a, a decent amount of respondents with uh, 1,000 plus employees, an equal amount for under 10 employees. So, so really good mix there. Uh, so before we get over to Paul, I wanted to I talked a bit about the Content Marketing Institute. If you get a chance, um, you know, obviously you're on this webcast, so you're interested in content. Uh, if you get a chance, sign up for their newsletter. You get a newsletter daily from the Content Marketing Institute. And they conduct an annual study um, coupled with marketing props, which is between CMI and marketing props, my two favorite uh, marketing uh, sources for information, both have daily emails. Um, this, but anyways, the study is listed in the research in the resources, and this is one of my favorite uh, slides in, in the uh, last year's study, which was or this uh, survey that was conducted in April 2018. So they do a B2B version. Uh, unfortunately, they do not do a construction vertical uh, version, but they do. Uh, a business to business version and a business to consumer version and the b2b version rated uh, uh we're also looking at the buyer's journey here and the content type that's most effective uh, when used for demand generation purposes so this slide is just a, a wonderful uh, amount of information and um, so the early uh, stage of a buyer's journey is a, is also awareness, interest, uh, timing. Uh, blog posts and articles uh, rank highest, and that is followed by uh, eBooks and podcasts and videos and things of that nature. So as uh, the buyer's journey moves to the middle stage of consideration and intent. Um, then uh, white papers uh, rank uh, highly at 53%. See that uh, there's a lot here, so 53%. Followed by uh, interactive content and case studies. So, so very interesting. And then as we move to the late stage where it's evaluation and purchase, then um, case studies move up to the number one position. And that, to me, that's intuitive. That uh, before uh, your customer, your prospect pulls the trigger. They want to just make sure that uh, that you've done this for a a company like them. So this is the B two B version of this, and uh, so I love this slide. Again, this will be in the presentation and and uh, a link to the to the overall study. So with that, I'm going to welcome back uh, Paul Deffenbaugh and. Uh, have Paul take it away. Well, good morning, afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. Neil, thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Um, one of the things that in talking about content marketing, it's such a broad field that I thought I would uh, narrow it down a little bit and talk about contributed content. Um, and so uh, if you can, yeah. And before I got into that, I want to do a little background, talk about uh, what's changed in the industry, uh, go back into days of yore and olden times and, and what things used to be like and what they're like now, because I think that change gives some perspective to how we approach content marketing today. For me, the goal of content marketing is to establish your firm as an expert in the field and build trust with your potential customers. Um, it, that way you can increase your margins, uh, speed your sales process, um, make life just a lot easier for yourself. And it's the unique attribute that content marketing brings as part of your overall marketing uh, uh, approach. Um, so you can see from the photos here, kind of an old school print uh, uh copy of a print magazine that we do, Metal Construction News, and then the, the digital versions that we're doing now. Um, the growth of electronic media, I remember back in the late 
90s trying to figure out how to handle all this new electronic media and what was going on and where we would be. And there was a lot of confusion. Um, there was a blog post I read in the late 90s, which I wish I could remember or find it and, and speak to it, but it compared to what was going on in electronic media to what happened right after uh, the Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press. And it took about 100 years after that innovation for the media world to figure out how to most efficiently use it. And I think we're in an area era of a lot of change and a lot of uh, confusion and, and don't know exactly what is successful and what's going to work. And, and the good side of that is that it's an era of experimentation and you can try a lot of different stuff. And one of the things that makes that happen and possible is you have all these new publishing platforms from the simple things like Facebook and Twitter to the more complicated like uh, a blog post uh, to even you know highly uh, sophisticated content management systems for websites. Um, it's much easier to publish content. And um, for those of us in the publishing world, this is a real new thing that all of a sudden the people who were our customers are now able to do what we do with fairly low barrier to entry. Um, there are some differentiations. I like to say that we're pretty good at identifying and engaging an audience and all of that. But there is an opportunity for whether it's a marketing agency or a manufacturer or a, a construction firm to talk directly to their audience on a, a, a fairly simple publishing platform. One of the other opportunities on uh, contributed content, especially on my side, is that uh, over this period of time, editorial budgets have gotten a lot tighter and we have to do more with less. So we're looking for more efficient ways to create good, strong, engaging content. And that means we're turning to people like you to get it. Um, and that's a great opportunity for you. The downside, to all of this uh, new publishing is that we are, uh, these next two kind of go together, we're overloading our audience and they're becoming more skeptical about the information we give them. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing a blog post, case studies, uh, eBooks, anything, you are facing an increasingly skeptical audience that is going to challenge you and less likely to buy in, which makes the engagement of what you're doing with content marketing more difficult. And so when I'm talking about contributed content, we can draw lessons about overall content marketing from this very specific idea. Um, I do want to have a word on PR lists. Um, you should know that I uh, pulled up my email this morning and I had four pitches for uh, contributed content to either our print or our electronic media. Um, I, like everybody else, am getting inundated. And it's because my name is on a PR list somewhere. And so I get stuff from India, from the UK, uh, from all over the United States. And um, it's, it's just a lot of stuff to weed through. So uh, let's go on to the next slide here, Neil. Yes, sir. Go ahead and fill, do the next build so we have the whole thing there. I thought it would be beneficial for me to talk about how we work at um, Modern Trade Communications. Um, our audience, we're a B2B publishing company, a niche public comp publishing company for the construction market. We serve uh, the AAC audience. We do two magazines, they're tabloid size, uh, 12 times a year. Uh, four editorial staff people plus a couple of freelance art directors produce all that. We also do monthly newsletters. We do digital editions. We do our websites. We have an annual directory. We do supplements to the magazine. This year we're di we did five supplements to the magazines as well, well as a, uh, a show guide for our big trade show. Um, and then we also do webinars. Uh, we do one webinar on average a month. So we're creating a ton of content and we're looking for help to do that. And so there are contributed content opportunities to work with us. What I try to do is define those opportunities for our audience. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One, it gives me more control over what we do. If I don't define, this is where you can contribute content, and this is how you can contribute content, I'm in the awkward position of having to say no to anything that's pitched, just what seems like a whim. This way I can 
put things into a specific slot and say, here's how we handle it, here's the way it works for you. And the way we do it is um, in metal construction news and in metal architecture, we have uh, two sections. One is in the details for uh, MCN, and one is called metal fine points for metal architecture. They are specifically contributed content sections where people, uh, whether they're advertisers or anybody, can uh, provide content for the magazines. They're one-page articles. We categorize them ahead of time. You can look on our editorial calendar and see that in March, we're going to cover insulated metal panels, or in May, we're going to cover uh, metal ceiling systems. And then you can provide that information, uh, plan it ahead in your marketing plan as well. Um, and what we aim for is technical information. We, uh, it, it's not a marketing piece. It is a technical information that will give our audience more information. And I'm going to talk about that more as well. There are times, of course, when things are great content that don't fit into those slots that we've defined, and we use guest columns and things like that as an opportunity there. We don't do guest blogs, though. Um, I know lots of places do. Um, our engagement on blogs is not as high. I think I talk at the top, of the, you can see at the top of the, the slide there, that we are still print-centric. Our We believe our audience, and from all of our surveying, is print-centric. Um, it, it's important to know that the average age of a construction worker in the United States is over 50 years old. So we're talking to people who are a little bit more comfortable with print. They like to uh, have it laid down in front of them. Doesn't mean they're not reading it on their phones also. And we do do digital versions of all of our magazines for uh, both uh, web platforms and, and mobile platforms. But um, we don't get as much engagement on blogs and, and websites and that sort of thing. Uh, but we do do webinars. And uh, the way we work our webinars, and this is uh, interesting for, for folks because it is all contributed content. Um, we work with uh, advertisers who have put together usually an AIA course or something like that that uh, they can repurpose and do as a webinar presentation. And essentially our job is to deliver our audience. Um, and, and it's a great way for uh, content to uh, get specific uh, that is important to you to go specifically to our audience. Um, for perspective, we have about 30,000 readers in each of our magazines and about 10% overlap between the two magazines. So here are uh, 55 to 60,000 total readers uh, that we reach out to and then we get a pretty good engagement from the webinars. Let's go to the next one here. Can you see it, Paul? Mm, hasn't come through yet. Maybe the audience. All right. Um, I can I'll see. keep going. Yep. Yeah. If you can see it, that's good enough. Um, so I wanted to do some seven tips for contributed content. Uh, and uh, we're up to tip number two here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, tip number one, uh, it, make your pitch count. Um, this is when you approach me, and uh, I'll tell you how I like to work, and it's a great way to maybe get another understanding of, uh, I think maybe other editorial directors work differently, but I'm not certain that they're not a lot similar to me, and that was a lot of knots in one sentence. Um, I like to be approached by email. Uh, you know, most people do. Don't call me. Uh, it takes more time. It's harder to, uh, to work through. Um, but when you do approach by email, like I said, I have four or five pitches already uh, today. Um, you've got to break through uh, my awareness. And the best way to do that is into uh, breaking the query into small chunks of information. I don't read seven pa seven paragraph queries. I'm just not going to. Um, I'll read the first paragraph and make my decision there, uh, whether I want to continue on. And I don't think, uh, I think most people are like that. Talk to any group of people about emails and the common phrases. I don't read below the bottom of the screen. Um, and that's normal. So you have to make your pitch in that first paragraph and have your call to action. And you don't need to pitch the whole story. All you need to do is pitch the idea of a story and say, email me back, we'll fill you in, or call me. 
That doesn't mean that if I don't call you or email you back, that it's not a good idea to go ahead and ring me up and uh, uh, call me. If you're going to phone me, do it as a follow-up to an email. Um, probably, it's I probably am not going to remember the one that you sent me specifically. So a reminder is good. It helps me along. Um, it, it's because I'm receiving so many of these narrowing them down to the one that you're interested in becomes difficult. So what you want to do is help the editor along, say, hey, I sent you this a couple of days ago. It was an idea about this. I'd love to talk to you about it some more and, and follow up that way. Um, when you're pitching, you have to know our style and what our content is. Um, we're uh, I put in here business versus technical. I know a number of folks on the, f the phone here may be working for uh, residential contracting firms, home builders, or remodelers, so your audience is going to be homeowners. That's not an audience we serve. Uh, so if you want to pitch something to me, um, you're pitching it to the wrong person because you're not going to reach the audience you want. We're also, we're not a business magazine. We're more product and technical oriented. So you want your content to be geared towards what we're doing. I get a lot of pitches for business content, legal issues and those sorts of things that aren't quite right for us. We do cover business, but sparingly and, and not very often. Um, if you want to pitch that kind of thing, you need to go find another magazine or publisher who is uh, more appropriate for that kind of content. I can tell immediately whether you have a concept uh, idea of what we do just by all you have you gone to our websites and looked at what our content is so you can see I mean we cover products we cover projects uh, we cover t uh, technical information um, trends um, and you by approaching me with a query if you've done a bit of research uh, on our websites, asked for our editorial calendars, looked at our editorial calendars, you're going to be in a much better position to gear your pitch towards my needs. Um, and it's a good idea to say, you know, if I'm interested, uh, say, hey, can you send me an example of a, uh, something that you thought was really good? And then you have a template for how to proceed. And then I kind of jokingly here say, uh, know you, when you say know your style to an editor, is it AP or Chicago style? Um, that's a little bit farther down the road when you're you're uh, writing your content and sending it to me uh, more so for print than uh, online. But uh, it really helps an editor if you have matched the style to the style of the magazine, if you're using AP style because it speeds along their editing process. Um, let's go to tip, tip number two here, Neil. Um, understand our audience. Uh, I, I covered this a little bit, commercial versus residential versus in, industrial. Are we research oriented? Um, is that the kind of market that we, kind of information we, we handle? Do we cover marketing trends? Um, do we provide installation information? A lot of that depends on the audience, who the contract, and are we talking to contractors, architects, or engineers? And I think these three people have different approaches. My attitude about contractors is generally they have a problem and they're looking for a solution to that problem. And usually it's an installation, it's a product need, it's something like that. How can I solve that problem for that contractor? That's how I get the best engagement from our contractor audience. For the best engagement from our architect audience, they want to know what's going to happen in the future. They're, they're, they want to see what the trends are, and they want to see lots of projects so they can see what other architects are doing and kind of def, divine a trend out of those kinds of uh, 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 analysis, looking at other projects and see what's happening. Um, and engineers, they want the technical stuff. They want to know how it fits into uh, the technical issues, so it has to be really specific to their needs. And uh, these three kinds of people read very differently. And by this I mean contractors are more likely to scan incredibly superficially. And if they catch something that grabs their eye, they'll do a deep dive. And it doesn't matter whether that's online or in print. Architects are very visual oriented and they're looking at images and what is shown as an image on their pay on the page attracts them much more. So Metal Architecture Magazine, we really boost up the images and we do full spread images and we, we bring the copy down. Um, engineers, 
it, when they get interested, they're going to do as deep a dive as you can. So you have to get really granular and give them technical information as deep as you can. And for anybody, that's a difficult thing. But it's a great opportunity if you're doing contributed content for, say, a building product manufacturer trying to reach this audience because you have inside knowledge about the, uh, the depth, uh, inside knowledge about your products, about the installation, about the testing that you, an audience wants. You have expertise that you want to showcase. Um, and then the last item here I want to talk about was supply chain dynamics. Really, when you're looking at an opportunity for contributed content or any kind of content marketing platform that you want to get to, you really have to kind of identify who's doing the buying and who's doing the selling. And that'll tell you a lot. Uh, for us, metal architecture, it's a very simple thing. Um, advertisers, building product manufacturers, and service providers are trying to reach the architecture audience. On the metal construction news side, it's a little more complicated because we have coating manufacturers who are selling to uh, roll former manufacturers who are selling to contractors. There's multiple points of buying and selling, so we're serving multiple audiences in that, and it can be a little complicated. I think that's true in many places in the construction supply chain. Um, so let's go to tip number three here now. All right. The great opportunity in contributed content is the access to expertise. I, I mentioned this. You have within, whether it's a, you're an agency representing the building product manufacturer or a building product manufacturer or a contractor, you have people inside your company who are experts in their field. They just know the stuff cold. And if you can get out of their head to your audience that information, and you're not going to be giving away any trade secrets here, get that information, you're going to engage people at an incredibly high level and have really high buy-in. Those people often need coaxing, and they need help communicating. Um, they, you want to get, you know, you want to make that person an expert and present that expert to the industry as an expert. It builds up their profile and it builds up your company's profile. A lot of tricks for doing that. Um, one, interview them, uh, record it, transcribe what they say, clean it up, give it back to them, and have them approve what you've written. That's the simplest way to do it. Uh, lots of different uh, uh, alternative story methods you could do. Do a Q&A with them. Do uh, you know four tips from uh, blog post by. You could brand this person as an expert. One of our uh, advertisers has a blog called The Code Man, and they branded a person in the company as the code expert. Um, use the opportunity to overcome objections. Oh, uh, uh, a final word on that one, though they may already have written what you want. Uh, it's my belief that within companies are exist already so much content that you can access that is easily repurposable. It's been written, it's hiding on computer drives, you have to go and find it, and when you find it, most of the information in the construction world is evergreen. It's not so timely that it can't be a few years old and you can repurpose it easily and just take those nuggets that exist already and with a little bit of effort, turn them into new new opportunities. Um, I also think that contributed content and content marketing is an opportunity to overcome objections. Talk to your sales staff. Find out what the biggest objection in the marketplace to the purchase of your product is or service is. What do your customers say when they say no? And then you address that issue, that objection, directly through your content marketing. If it's price, address it through your content marketing. Talk about the difference between price and value. If it's uh, a quality, talk about the, uh, how, how your company diver, delivers quality and, and show them. Um, what are the major reasons people choose your competitors over you? and take those head on through your content marketing and through the contributed content. Uh, tip number four. All right, uh, this gets back to the idea of building an expert. Use a byline, claim your work. Uh, people wanna know who's writing the article. Blog posts, that's easy. Infographics, it's almost impossible. Um, for us, we want bylines on that contributed content. 
uh, we want to know what the qualifications of the expert speaking to the audience are. You're going to have so much higher buy-in if the audience believes that the voice they're hearing is a seasoned voice that understands their problem. Contractors especially. Um, I, I often tell people, contractors, the only people contractors believe with information are other contractors who are doing the same thing they are, because they're the only ones who really understand what that contractor is going through. And I believe that's true across not just contractors, but architects. We all feel that way. The only people who really understand our problems and the issues we're facing and trouble we have selling are people who are in the same position as we are. And by using a byline, you establish that expert as the person who is in that same position. Uh, you gotta you know, provide the person's qualifications and always give a bio, just a brief bio of the person, two sentences at the most. Um, I like to see what the person looks like. Uh, Non-professional picks send the wrong message. Um, we have done, we've had submitted for uh, our content photos of people with uh, uh, hats on backwards and sunglasses and, and and there's not a lot of buy-in because you can't see the face and there's a reaction to that attitude. You want it to look professional. It doesn't need to be professionally shot, but you want it to look professional because you have to know who your audience is. Remember in the construction industry, more than 50% of the workers in the construction industry are, are average age is over 50 years old. Homeowners have a different attitude. They're going to want to see a, a, a level of professionalism, especially in the remodeling market. They are so afraid of fly-by-night operators. They want to see experts. Um, and reasserting this, establishing your expertise, expertise, that all of these things, the job title, the bio, and the headshot present a complete picture of that person. Do not just use the company name as a byline. Nobody really uh, cares about that. It's just because it's obvious it's coming from that company. The byline is just a repetition of what you're already saying, and you're losing an opportunity to establish an expertise. And um, I asked this question, marketing department at bylines, because this is always something that we get. We have uh, contributed content that is written by a marketing person. And that's they, they tend to be well written, and let's face it, most marketing departments are writing this stuff. But I think you're better off ghostwriting it and having it over somebody else's name because you have that opportunity to raise the level of, of trust and expertise in your company. Tip number five: uh, know the requirements for the the contributed content. Know the length. Uh, Eight hundred word requirement means no longer. Um, if you want to give the designer flexibility, uh, you want to have, if you have more information, suggest it be added to the online version of the article. Now I'm speaking about print, but that's true with online. You want to know what the parameters are, what the company, what, what the opportunity is. If you're, if you're delivering, delivering a 1600 word article or a 20 minute video or whatever it is, and the expectation is half of that, you're not engaging the audience as much as you want to. And the person you're talking to, who is the editor, has knows what the engagement levels are for his audience. That editor's been through the analytics on their website. They know what kind of uh, articles and get the highest engagement so you can trust them to direct you in the right direction. Um, again, kind of article oriented, but also this works for the website. It's true for print online. Um, I mentioned that contractors are skimmers, and they look for ideas and ways to burrow in deeper, so you have to have lots of points of entry. Um, one long, big bunch of copy is nobody's going to read it, so use sidebars, use pull quotes, use factoids, use captions, use subheads. Um, use all of those opportunities to give the reader a chance to get inside that article and make it provocative. Don't make a, a don't use a hub a subhead that says, in summary, because that's not provocative. Use something that says, that says, you know, last chance to buy, I'm making this stuff up off, off the top of my head and don't have a good one, but use something that in, is provocative and interesting and brings the audience in. Don't lose those opportunities to engage the audience. And remember, what you submit is going to be edited, and you may not like the edits. 
But this gets to the biggest issue with contributed content or content marketing. The great opportunity in content marketing is you get to control the content. But when you're contributing content, the editor wants to have control, so they're going to edit. And if you've written long or your video is long, you're definitely not going to like what is edited because they're going to take out stuff that you thought was important. And sometimes you're not going to see it before its final version. Most editors try to show you a final version, but you know if we're uh, a, on upload date and we have to go to the printer that day um, and I have a final edits to an article to make it fit, I don't have time to send it to you to, for approval. It's just going to go to the printer the way we think it should. Uh, tip number six. Uh, provide quality images. Uh, this is one of the things we see uh, so often. Uh, we'll get a great contributed article and it just has a static product shot next to it. Um, so you're losing the opportunity to engage the audience uh, with that image to uh, get a chance to get an eyeball deeper into the article um, because it doesn't show anything and it doesn't support the article the way it should support it. Graphs are great. Uh, installation prod product uh, shots are great, uh, action shots are great, and it doesn't matter whether that is uh, print or video, blog, online, anywhere, all of it works the same. You got to have a picture that goes with it that brings somebody uh, inside the article. Um, avoid putting your logos on contributed content because editors probably going to be uncomfortable showing your logo in the middle of an editorial page, and avoid pages that look like catalogs. Editors are uncomfortable with uh, just a catalog page coming through as a PDF. Uh, again, for the same reason, uh, they're definitely trying to differentiate between editorial and advertisement. One of the biggest issues that we've seen in this change uh, from print-centric to electronic media over the last 20 plus years is the fact that we have to be much more careful communicating to our audience who's saying what. Is it an advertiser or a building product manufacturer talking directly to the audience? Is it editorial staff talking to the audience? It is, is it a consultant talking to the audience? And we're very careful about making sure that our audience understands who's talking to them because we don't want to alienate an audience that is already skeptical. We don't want an audience to say, oh, you're just shilling. We want the audience to buy in and accept our expertise and understand uh, we want to build our own authority, so we're incredibly careful about making sure that we 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 communicate those issues to our audience. Um, and when you're sending uh, photos, you, you know know what the end game is going to be: 300 DPI for print, you know, whether it's 150 for web or 200 for web. Um, and <laughs> my 60 megabyte TIFF file. Uh, argument is because, quite frankly, I get too much of it. I'll have somebody give me a Dropbox with 10, 60 megabyte TIFF files, and it just it just chews up my computer. Uh, and so I, it becomes annoying. Um, let's go to tip number seven and our last tip. Um, so one of the things when you're talking to an audience, you're trying to speak their language as an expert. The biggest hands down, the biggest mistake I see in content marketing is that people can't avoid talking about their own product. They can't avoid promoting their, themselves. So they're constantly saying why their product is better. And that's got a place and it's valuable, but you're missing the opportunity in content marketing and contributed content of, of establishing expertise because you're, all you're doing is saying why your product is better. So avoid those market speak words, avoid world-class, avoid exclusive, avoid unsurpassed, avoid proven and unique. Um, we're, editors in print are gonna cut those out anyway because they're, they become meaningless words and they're unproven words. And you've lost an opportunity when you use those easy market speak words rather than very specific technical words that address this audience. Um, for example, if you say it's tested, that product has to have been tested in a lab, not just in the marketplace. It's that kind of specificity that is important to audiences. And you want to show your org expertise, but you also want to avoid jargon. Um, 
everybody says in the industry says uh, um, footings or footers. Uh, one is correct. And now all of a sudden I just blanked on which one is correct. A footer, a footer is incorrect. Footings are correct, I believe. Uh, so for some reason I blanked on this. Knowing the correct one is important to engaging your audience. One is jargon. One is specific and accurate. And then uh, avoid the, the tendency in all marketing uh, copy uh, of overstating things, which means uh, never use exclamation points. And uh, last slide for us, Neil, uh, a few bonus tips. Uh, this is English 101 stuff. You guys all know this, but it's important because I see so much of this. Organize the content that you have and how you're, con how you're uh, presenting it, whether it's con uh, an article, a blog post, video, no matter what it is, organize it in a way that is logical and understandable and has a progression to it, and tell your audience what that organization is. Tell them, here are the three things you're going to learn. Here's what I'm going to say. Uh, just communicate specifically and directly with the audience. And when you say something, be specific about it and be concise. The biggest problem we see in editorial content is somebody uses uh, 60 words to say 20. Uh, so that uh, 1500 word article becomes a 750 word article because we start cutting out the stuff that doesn't need to be there. Uh, and just because I'm an uh, old English teacher, avoid passive voice and ex exclamation points never. Did I say that twice? I think I mean, you said I that. <laughs> anyway, those are my ideas for contributing content. Um, I'd love to hear from anybody and what your, your concerns or interests are and um, whether this is uh, works for you. So, Neil, thank you very much. Um, and I think we have some questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Excellent uh, insight, and thanks for sharing the uh, editor's perspective, uh, since that's very important for marketers to understand. So we do have uh, some, some Q&A. Uh, we have some questions coming in. And um, I, I have one uh, really biting question that I want to ask you uh, before we dig in too deep. But how do you feel about exclamation points, Paul? Uh, it's, it's my favorite topic. <laughs> I, uh, real quick, I had a, a freshman high school English teacher who said that uh, pretend you have 100 exclamation points to use for the rest of your life. Okay. All right. So no, no exclamation points and no... No braggadocia about how great right. uh, your company, your product, your service, uh, and you certainly don't want to. There's a place for that. Yeah. There's a place absolutely. for that. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, or maybe after you write a good factual information, that the reader comes away saying, "Wow, this is a great company, a great product." Mm -hmm. and they infer it on their own. Maybe is the the point that that's the goal. Yeah, yep. to establish that expertise and build the trust. All right, so a couple of questions here. Um, and this one's definitely directed toward your uh, your presentation. How do you handle contributed content from non-advertisers? Oh, yeah, so that's this is one of the, tech, the touchy issues that everybody faces in the marketing world. We have uh, people who advertise with us and people who don't. Um, end game is my job is to serve our audience. And so we will handle contributed content from non-advertisers. Uh, we don't, pri we prioritize the people who are investing in our success. We recognize that we need advertisers to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, but we also need to be uh, 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 even handed across the board. And so non-advertisers get a chance to uh, contribute content. Um, and I've had many, many discussions from advertisers who spend a lot of money with us who ask why we gave free space to somebody else who isn't spending any money. And it's a valid point and a valid concern. The answer is always that we think it was a great article for our audience. And so put your advertisement next to that great article because my job is to deliver an audience. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how about... Uh... Would, will you run an article if it's being picked up by someone else? 
that's a great one because the, the repurposing of content is so common these days and it's understandable and it it really depends i always ask for exclusive um and i'd i'd like to get it but if it has run somewhere else that is uh a distant or non competitor to us i'll consider it um oftentimes people submit stuff to us that's already run on their blog site and i'd like it to go the other way contribute your article to us and then leverage it through your social media, through your blogs, and other ways. Use us as your starting point for that article, and then spread it out from there, repurpose it from that point. We have a question that I think you already answered. Maybe they asked it before uh, you spoke, but they said, for bylines, do you list both the author and the name of the expert? Um, and I think you would probably say right. that you want the whole article to be bylined by the expert, not the marketing department. Correct. Yeah, you want that person's name front and center, the expert's name front and center for the audience. Right. All right, here's a, here's one that uh, you'll have to dig deep on. How are you convincing advertisers that the audience is still print-centric? Oh, great question. Uh, we do lots of surveys. Um, and uh, we can we can show advertisers. Uh, we do reader surveys. We can show advertisers uh, what percentage of our our subscribers are reading, how many articles they read on average, or how many issues they read open, and how many they read on average a year. Um, and um, it, it is it's easy to show. Actually, um, it's not. I will say that it's not a hundred percent print centric. Um, I know that. The people who are reading us online or the people who are reading our newsletters, while they may be in our industry, may not be the same audience as those reading our print. So we're reaching out to them as well. It expands our scope. Uh, but yeah, the surveys we use, and, and uh, that's the best way. And there's a ton of research out there about the value of print, especially in uh, B2B marketing. I agree. Now, there's uh, one of the reasons for uh, content marketing and article placement is to have a uh, backlink or what SEO consultants might call a do follow link back to uh, the, the person's website or the brand's website that's uh, writing the article. Do you allow for those types of links to happen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if, if it, when it gets up online or if we use it in our newsletter, we always have the links to the website. Um, if they provide a specific page that, the, that they want us to go to, we'll do that. Um, so, yes. Okay. Yeah, and that is, uh, it's still so important, this link building, and, it, and it's one of the reasons why why uh, media relations and article writing and placement it, uh, it's still uh, from a from a SEO standpoint, it helps uh, the brand, you know, build their authority and build their traffic and and that kind of thing. So it's a it's a major reason to be undertaking content marketing. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, and it's worth saying that uh, in looking at our analytics for our website, some of our higher performing articles on our website are contributed content pieces. And part of the reason is that there is a link sharing that goes along there. It's not just Google that's sending people to those articles. It's also the manufacturer directing them to those articles and us directing them to the manufacturer. Good point. All right. Uh, any uh, big trend or next big thing uh, that you see in content marketing? Yeah, this, I, I'm, I'm not a trend kind of person. Um, I, I kind of look at the foundational issues that we're, we seem to be still battling. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, the skeptical audience is a very hard thing to overcome. Um, and I think the audience is going to be continued to be more and more skeptical, um, which means it's going to just make it harder to engage them. It's going to be harder to break through. And at the same time that they're more skeptical, they're more overloaded. So for content marketing, those people who establish themselves as, ex as experts are going to have a much better chance of that. But the other side of that is control. 
the biggest thing, I don't, you know, it's almost like it's a truism across industry, across every, anything. Everybody wants more control over what they're creating. Um, we're seeing it in the contractor field where more and more contractors are bringing services in-house, services that they uh, they separated out to trade contractors years ago. They're now bringing them in and self-performing them because they want more control. Uh, building product manufacturers are, are trying to control the supply chain more. Uh, they're going buying distributors they're buying point of sale people so they can control that they're even buying installation uh companies so they can control the installation of the product so that's true on this side also so i think this idea of uh creating more content and controlling the content that we create and controlling the audience that we have uh from uh manufacturers from agencies from service providers is going to continue it's just going to grow and grow because we want more control over the, the material we send out. Sure. And because content marketing is such a hot topic, um, everyone's jumping into publishing. And and so some people are not good at it. Uh, yeah. so there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of bad content out there. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of fake news. <laughs> So all these all these things, um, you know, the quality of content as the volume of content uh, um, becomes like a fire hose. You know, maybe maybe there's a give and take there with quality as well. So so to your point, um, uh, there's still a place for quality content and um, accurate and technical and interesting and uh, but but now there's all kinds of noise uh, all around all around us, and so you have to break through that somehow. And and you know it's it's so easy to hear about all the clickbait stuff. Uh, it's so easy to in, to get an audience to click on somebody, but you're not engaging the audience. The audience. So you know uh, we always joke around here. Uh, the the perfect article for us would be uh first they poured the foundation and then you won't believe what happened next um uh -huh. that would be a great title uh yeah. but it's just clickbait and it gets to that issue of quality versus uh, uh quantity and part of the problem is everybody plays it as a numbers game right you know if i if i if i get 100,000 hits that generates Two percent leads. Correct. That yeah. Well, uh, I think yeah. Let's uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so so let's keep it going. Uh, I'll give you a little um, quick background on Construction Marketing Association. Uh, we're focused on uh, marketing for construction products and services, providing resources. We have a career center. We have a marketing certification program and uh, we have marketing services. We have a website, an award-winning blog, a LinkedIn uh, a group, a very active LinkedIn group. Uh, there's our career center uh, that you can get from the homepage as well. Our next webcast is our Outlook uh, webcast that we do always in early uh, to mid-January. So I hope you'll join us for that. We'll have a survey going out for marketing planning for the, the new year. And uh, in the appendix of this presentation, why you're going to want to uh, uh, download this uh, after the fact are all these juicy resources. I, I mentioned the 2019 uh, B2B Content Marketing Research Study uh, done jointly by the Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Prof. So we have a link to that. You're certainly welcome to Google that as well. Uh, We've got a CMA blog on content for every stage in the client life cycle. Uh, we've got a webcast and, and uh, survey on blogging best practices in the construction market. Uh, inbound marketing uh, is uh, a, a term that is intertwined with content marketing. So uh, we, we do have a good uh, uh, blog and a webcast and survey on that. And um, certainly uh, self-improvement, we always like to include in our resources, uh, the CCMP program. Uh, we've got our, our book, Tools of the Trade, uh, Modern Marketing for Construction Brands, and then again, that Career Center. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, 
thank uh, Paul Deffenbaugh for all his help and, and insight today. Uh, thank all of you who have registered and participate, participated in our webcast. And um, lastly, uh, our bios, Paul and my bio, uh, are in the, in the appendix here of this webcast. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you.